Hey guys, this is Kevin here from Hanna Instruments, and today we're going to be talking about phosphorus and phosphate in your reef tank. Some of the many parameters that you test for, phosphates are definitely one you want to monitor on a regular basis. And there's a couple reasons why you want to do that. Uh, for one, phosphates are often considered algae's best friend. It's uh, one of the main nutrients that uh, drive algae growth. So if you have excessive phosphates in your reef tank, you're going to get a lot of algae growth in the glass, on the rocks, things like that. Uh, also, if you have too much phosphates, a lot of the times it's, it's believed that phosphates will, uh, high phosphates will reduce calcification rates on many corals, particularly those referred to as SPS or small polyp stony corals. And, you know, over time, if you have corals living in your tank, the goal is to get them to grow, and excessive phosphates is thought of to uh, you know, reduce the rate at which corals grow. It might make their skeletons more brittle or things like that. Um, but at the same time, you also don't want to have a complete lack of phosphates either uh, because phosphates or phosphorus is an essential nutrient for coral growth. And this is because coral are symbiotic organisms that have a specific type of algae-like or uh, organism that lives inside them called uh, zooxanthellae, and zooxanthellae use uh, phosphorus as a nutrient for photosynthesis. And corals derive a lot of their energy from this zooxanthellae or from the photosynthetic process, and a lot of the times we need phosphates in our water in order for there to be enough uh, nutrients for the coral to grow and develop. Um, so there's kind of a, a balance between not having a complete lack of phosphates, but also having not too much, we might get excessive algae growth or reduced calcification rates. So there's, there's a couple ways, let's say you get uh, too many phosphates in your water. The, the number one source of phosphates in a reef tank comes from food. Food ha is loaded with phosphates. Uh, feeding your fish too much will definitely increase the phosphate level in your water. So you want to be mindful of how you're feeding, make sure that an un un eaten food ends up in the overflow box and your filter socks or things like that. Um, so that's one aspect of phosphates, but uh, sometimes the use of tap water can also cause phosphate. So if you use tap water as your uh, salt water mixing or if you use it for your auto top off, that can also lead to higher phosphates in your water because there might be some, uh, some in the start. So in order to reduce that, you can use a reverse osmosis deionization filter. Uh, use that water, RODI water, for your top off and for mixing salt. Um, the lack of skimming will cause uh, high phosphates, excessive fish in your tank. Um, you know, but different ways to reduce it are increasing your uh, protein skimmer output. You can use media such as granular ferric oxide or GFO to help remove phosphates. Um, you can do things like carbon dosing that would also potentially help but um, you know the port most one of the more important things in this you want to test for it so you know where your levels stand so you don't you know add too much gfo and strip all your faucets out of the water or add too much uh, you know whatever carbon dosing source you're using your, and help and plummet your levels down too much so it's, uh, it's really important that you test for them so you know where your levels stand. And different corals may or may not require different amounts of phosphate. Certain corals like lower phosphate levels, certain corals may like higher phosphate levels. And there definitely are examples of uh, corals living in reef aquariums with very high phosphates. But uh, for the most part, people try and keep their phosphates in a reef tank uh, relatively low to prevent excessive algae or to prevent uh, calcification from uh, slowing. So. Corals that are referred to as SPS, or small polyp stony corals, generally require a little bit lower phosphates, or they keep in low nutrient systems, or things maybe like soft coral, leather corals, toadstools, zoanthids, things like that. They may require higher phosphates just because they're, you know, they're, it's not, there's not a lot of calcium carbonate structures to them. Um, they're mostly fleshy tissue, and they, you know, they get a lot of their energy from photosynthetic, uh, from zooxanthellae and things like that. So um, there's, there's kind of a debate amongst the hobby of what your phosphate level should be. Um, you know, whether you think you can keep higher phosphates, whether you think you can keep lower phosphates, um, it's just important that you test for them to know where your levels stand. Um, so you don't want to be, you know, using too much GFO, or you remove everything or things like that. So uh, it, when you test for phosphates, almost all of the test kits in the hobby are measuring something called orthophosphates. So uh, orthophosphates are one of the many types of phosphorus-based compounds found in the marine waters. Um, phosphorus in and of itself can be pretty complex. There's different forms of it in an aquarium or in marine and saltwater in general. Um, so uh, a lot of the test kits, or almost all the test kits we use, measure this orthophosphates or inorganic orthophosphates um, to test for other types of forms of phosphorus or things like that. It becomes much more difficult um, to do. So uh, pretty much all your standard test kits and the test kits that we use for the saltwater aquarium industry at Hanna Instruments are measuring orthophosphates. And we primarily have two uh, ways to measure uh, or two types of checkers for uh, measuring this. We have our uh, low range phosphate checker and our ultra low range phosphorus checker. 
And these two things are actually both measuring orthophosphates, they're measuring the same thing, um, but they, it's all about the different ranges and the minimum detection limits that the two can measure. So our low range phosphate checker here, which measures in parts per million phosphate, that'll read anywhere from zero to 2.5 ppm or parts per million of phosphate. While the ultra low range model here, this guy will read anywhere from zero to 200 parts per billion phosphorus, which equates to about um, 0 0.003 up into about 0.6 parts per million phosphate. So you can see the range is you know, significantly lower in terms of the, the maximum and minimum detection limit, uh, but that leads to an increased accuracy at, uh, at lower ranges or just overall. So the accuracy st statement on this checker is plus or minus a, a 0 0.04 ppm or so. Um, 0.04 ppm, well this guy is five parts per billion, which is about 0 0.015 ppm. So it's much, much, much smaller, it's almost twice as accurate. Uh, so if you're trying to keep, uh, you know, just low nutrient systems or things like that, this is definitely the unit you want. Um, it's a much more accurate unit for detecting phosphates at low ranges. Again, that's the HI736, the ultra low range phosphorus checker. And we include this in our marine line of products. It's specifically designed for saltwater aquariums. And uh, we have this, we keep this measurement so we can get a more refined result at lower ranges. So if you're gonna run this test, you get everything you need to start testing here. We have our two cuvettes here, so you only need one to run the test, this little glass vial. So I'm gonna take one of these out. You can get one of these uh, powder reagent sachets. The test only requires one sachet, uh, so you don't need to, uh, you know, have, there's no liquids or syringes or anything like that. It's just one powder packet, it's pre-measured and everything for you. And these powder packets are, um, they're nice because you're not going to contaminate a whole batch of, uh, of powder if you spill some water in there or you don't have to worry about leveling out a scoop or things like that. Everything is pre-measured and pre-designed and these packets do a good job of keeping the sensitive reagent protected during transit or storage or things like that. So we're just going to get all this stuff ready here. We're going to use our HI736 ultra low range checker and we're going to sample of salt water here. So. Um, with this test, the, this test is the ascorbic acid method. Um, it require, it's a very time sensitive method, uh, meaning that the chemical reaction in this method is very time sensitive. There's a specific window for detection. So um, this checker has a built in three minute timer, but we include a, a relatively short auto shutoff feature on this checker because we don't want the reagent or, or the user to overmix the reagent and then cause the, uh, the chemical reaction window to you know, lose that specific time sensitive window for the reaction to take place. So one thing we recommend doing, and since it does have a short auto shutoff feature, is before you turn on your meter, or before you, you know, begin turn on the meter or anything like that, uh, you wanna actually take your cuvette and you wanna fill your cuvette with salt water. So I'm just gonna use a little 10 mil syringe here. Again, you can just fill it up to the line. Uh, either by dipping it in the tank, but I, I find it a little easier sometimes just to use a 10 mil syringe. Alrighty. And then I'm just gonna get a little microfiber wipe to wipe down any fingerprints in the glass that may have been caused by that. And you're gonna take your powder reagent sachet and we're actually going to open it up now before we turn on the meter. And uh, there's a very kind of specific way to open these up. Um, Definitely want to use scissors. We, we have a little dotted line on the top here with little scissor marks. Uh, you cut along that dotted line, that definitely is probably one of the easiest ways to do it. Uh, one little trick that I like to do that I, I find particularly helpful is I like to get all of the, the powder before I open the packet down in this bottom corner where you know close to the expiration and lot uh, symbols down there. So I get all that powder packet down there. And I'm gonna take the corner with this bottom dotted line right here, the, you know, and I'm gonna actually fold it up so that dotted line is directly across the top of there. And I'm gonna kind of create a little crease right here, right where along that full, along I guess the hypotenuse of that little triangle that I made. So I'm gonna take my pair of scissors and I'm just gonna cut straight across the top there, right? And that way when I unfold this, I have a nice little crease that I just created that folds right back. It can bend and all your powder is there easy to be dispensed later on. And again, we do this because the meter has a short auto shut off feature, so I think it's a good idea to just, uh, you know, turn on, the, before we turn on the meter to get this stuff ready, you can still perform the test uh, without doing this method, you know, you just have to be a little bit quick with it. Uh, but keeping, getting all your stuff ready definitely helps. Um, so right now I'm gonna turn on the meter, we're gonna get this C1 phase. At this C1 phase, I'm gonna insert this cuvette inside the checker, I'm gonna close the hood, 
And again, what we like to do is we just, I like to face this little 10 mil marker forward. It's something called indexing the cuvette. And uh, since these guys use light and the light pathway, the uh, pathway when it goes through glass, rounded glass isn't always the same. So we like to just index that cuvette to make sure the pathway stays the same between our C1 and our C2 phase. So I'm gonna close this checker up and I'm gonna hit my button here. It's gonna flash and eventually go to a C2 phase. Uh, during this time, what I like to do is also get a little timer ready. Uh, I have to use just a, you know, my phone or a stopwatch or something like that. But um, the reason I do this is the, um, the, uh, the instructions require uh, two minutes of shaking the reagent. So during this time, I'm going to open it up. I'm going to add my powder reagent inside the cuv uh, cuvette. So it's already open, so I'm just going to pour that all down there. I like to gently tap it and use that the end of the crease where I just got all my stuff. And again, once I do that, I could just pop this open like this, peel one corner. That's another good thing. You could tap again and you could just pour the rest of the powder reagent there. And you don't have to worry about getting everything out. You don't have to scrape the corners or things like that. As long as all the loose reagent is out, it's, that's definitely fine. Now once the powder's in, I'm going to start my timer. And I'm going to gently shake for about two minutes um, or the powder reagent's completely dissolved. This, you know, you don't want to vigorously shake it to create a lot of air bubbles. You just want to gently invert the cuvette and just gently shake it to, uh, you know, make sure everything is nicely dissolved for about two minutes. All right, so once I have the reagent all mixed up here, I'm going to then I'm going to insert this cuvette back inside the checker here. I'm going to close the checker hood and I'm going to hold down this button and a three minute timer will start on the checker. And again, this three minute timer and the two minutes of shaking the reagent uh, indicates the proper window for the chemical reaction to take place. Um, so you don't have to, you know, hold down and use the timer internally. You can use an external timer, if you, but again, we built one in there to make it easy for you. Uh, so at the end of this three minutes, we're going to get a result of, uh, in our salt water of phosphorus uh, in parts per billion or orthophosphate displayed as phosphorus in parts per billion. Uh, this is the same unit measurement you would get uh, on the, the 713. However, um, this meter is designed for reading lower ranges, thus you know, anything like an SPS aquarium or any sort of low nutrient system environment or things like that. And this is the one that is, usually is better for most reef aquariums. So we got our result after the three minute timer and we have a reading of 14 parts per billion. So if you wanted to figure out what this means in terms of parts per million phosphate, what you'd have to do is take this number and you would multiply it by 3.066 and then take that number again and divide by 1000. And that equals 0.043 parts per million phosphate. Um, again, that uh, conversion is just based off different molecular weights in an orthophosphate molecule. Um, and we, you know, we do this to get a more refined measurement at lower ranges and for getting more accurate results at, at low range detection limits that many reef tanks uh, desire. Um, so if you want to measure anything from about 0 0.003 parts per million up to about 0.6, um, which is most reef aquariums, this, this checker is definitely the one for you. Um, you know, this is definitely a, a unit that is uh, highly accurate and really good at measuring phosphates at low, low detection limits. Thank you for watching everyone. I appreciate you taking the time to learn about phosphorus and phosphates in your reef tank. And make sure to check out the description below for a link to a conversion table that will actually convert parts per billion phosphorus to parts per million phosphate for the HI736 ultra low range phosphorus checker. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.